wild food. That's what hunting and gathering is all about. This is a journey into Britain's ancient way of life as we attempt to find the foods eaten by our hunter-gatherer ancestors. Some things never change. It's late summer and a very busy time for farmers bringing in their harvests. And of course, that was true of our ancestors too because the late summer is a time of great bounty in terms of wild foods. But our ancestors weren't just gatherers, they were also hunters. And if we're to understand their diet, it's terribly important that we explore the world of the hunter. It's all about the tools they had and the weapons they made. About the game they tracked and the signs they could read. If I can begin to see our landscape through the eyes of a hunter, it will help me connect with our past and the animals that still roam wild here today. We'll need to find the plants which could have given them the energy to hunt, could have flavoured and helped preserve their meat, and would balance such a protein-rich diet. Our forebears were nomads, setting camp near the resources they needed, and I'm going to do the same. Helping me is Professor Gordon Hillman from University College London, a world expert on the archaeology of wild foods. Gordon's knowledge of plants and my experience with tribal people come together in our quest to bring our silent past alive. Hi Gordon, how's it going? Oh, well. So it's already, already beginning to look a bit like home, isn't it? Yeah. Hunting is an exhausting business and needs high energy supplies. One food our forebears could have turned to is pendulous sedge. It's just what we're after. Perfect. Actually perfect. It's quite heavy too. So it's got good size seeds in it. Mm. Now, what's interesting about the pendulous sedge is its great abundance and ease of gathering when um, at this time of year. And I reckon that this is the sort of food that um, a party of hunters or family traveling between other seasonal gluts might well have made use of. They uh, could easily gather this, grind it up between rocks and cook it into a simple bread, um, which is quite sustaining. There's not a, not a great number of, of seed plants that you can actually strip in this way. But it works in this case very nicely. And they're just, just nicely ready for the plucking right now. Of course, we're collecting a bit of wildlife with it, of course, unintentionally. How are you doing there, Gordon? Well, it's going on well. It's, uh, it's, yeah. uh, a lot of this is just slightly green, which is good. Yeah, um, it's a bit of moisture, isn't it? That's yeah. right. So it would be quite so husky as it would be, would be otherwise. And you can imagine, can't you, people travelling through the ancient forests and coming across stand of this looking like that and they know that someone's been Some along. Female, absolutely, yes. They've been here. That's a visiting card. Pendulous sedge doesn't suffer from ergot fungal infection, so they're a safe seed, but complicated to process. We start by winnowing, grinding and parching with hot rocks. Hot, 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 hot. Ready? Hear them popping? You absolutely can. I think there's some, there's some partial going on there. I tell you what, it looks different, doesn't it? You see the way it's moving there? It's more yeah, like, it is. moving more like a liquid. It is. It's, it's got a fluid uh, texture to it. So uh, we're not only uh, parching the gr grain and making it uh, dehuskable here, we're also uh, uh, are cooking the insects, so there, of which there are plenty, insects and spiders, thousands of them in here, little tiny ones. And uh, not only are we getting this protein and other nutrients from, from the insects, we're also getting their, their droppings, their feces. And, uh, it's said that they're quite rich in, in, in some of the B vitamins. So there you go, Ray. Uh, uh, a nutritious meal indeed. Uh, which, which of the B vitamins are involved? Thank you for that, Gordon. I don't know. I've always wanted to know that. Well, that's, 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 that's reassuring that you're feeding yourself so, so, uh, so comprehensively. I don't know whether you can see that, but that's what we're after. Those are the nutlets, and those have been removed from all of this material. 
Then the nutlets are ground to make a starchy biscuit, which can be baked in the ashes. I've always looked at these at this time of year, when you, you, you might imagine hunters now thinking about making journeys to areas that are better for hunting and for fishing. This is exactly the sort of thing they might need. Yes. And it, it, that it's a very easy thing to, to try and make enough for a couple of days, That's travel right. on. It'll, it'll keep for several days a, a biscuit of this sort. Right? Yeah, it's ideal for carrying with you. That's right. But, and you know as well as I that these biscuits are much more nutritious than anything that we're used to today. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A uh, very concentrated source of starch, and uh, of course, a lot of them, uh, a lot of these seed foods go quite oily, and uh, a lot more cheery as well. Yeah. Well, I think I want to have a look at it now. I don't want to leave it too long. There it is. There. That's not bad at all. A bit, bit, a bit more gritty than usual. I quite like that. They've got no problem. It's, I think chocolate coating on the top. You can <laughs> sell it. <laughs> And this bit that's still here, I don't know if you can smell that, it's just starting to burn in the embers of that little bit that fell off. And that is the smell of burning bread. It is. That's something right. that, we sh that our ancestors knew as well as we do today, Indeed. the smell of burning bread, but it meant an awful lot more to them, because they had to go to the efforts of collecting all the seeds. Right. So with biscuits in their bags, they had their supplies. But these Stone Age hunters needed weapons. And 10,000 years ago, in the Mesolithic, the bow and arrow really came into its own, with arrowheads made out of flint. Trying to drive off long, narrow blades, this sort of thing. And those were the stock in trade of the Mesolithic craftsmen. The tools from the Mesolithic are quite fascinating because they're very tiny. It's this small blade that I'm going to use to make the arrow point. I'm going to use a pressure flaker, which is basically a sharpened piece of antler, to help me create little blades, tiny, tiny blades. And the next step is to set the arrowhead on the shaft. Well, there's the, there's the groove that I've cut. And here is the point. And that will fit quite snugly now into that notch. And to hold it in place, I'm going to glue it. It's not even bound on. It's just glued in place using what I think was the key revolution of the Mesolithic, which is birch tar glue. And that's what I've got there on the end of that stick. This is um, like the epoxy of its age. It's thermoplastic. I can, can heat it up over the fire. It melts. And I put it on there, push the point in, and when it cools, it sets rock hard. I've extracted this birch tar from the bark of the tree using modern methods, but we're not certain how this was done in the Mesolithic. Many of the arrows from this period were left just like that. And that's perfectly capable of doing what it needs to. But there was one found in the archaeological record from Denmark that shows another blade fitted behind. And that's what I'm going to do here. Multiple haftings like this are very typical of the Mesolithic and serve to cause more hemorrhaging, thus bringing the animal down faster. Very satisfying making that. I think our ancestors would have been quite happy with that as an arrow. And at the time these arrows were being used, we know that bows like this one were in use. This is one that I've made from witch elm. And it's a copy of a bow called, the, one, of, one of several bows from a site called Holmgard. And they are the earliest bows found. Very few bows are found in the archeological record. Lots of arrows of thousands and endless copious numbers of projectile points, but very few bows. 
and that's what was being used. Very elegant design, very effective, and this wood is extremely tough and resilient. It makes for a first-rate bow. And there is the hunting apparatus of the past. Very effective, that would have been too. And to see just how effective, I have to let this arrow fly. You can see that's quite a devastating injury for a leg of lamb. But if this was live living tissue, it would be even worse. The arrow may well have gone all the way through. And very often animals hit with an arrow are poleaxed, not flat. It's an interesting weapon. And when it arrived in the Mesolithic, just the beginning of the Mesolithic, it gave the hunter the ability to reach out through undergrowth into tight circumstances to bring home the food. And our ancestors' lives depended on it leaving behind evidence of many successful hunts, which Dr Peter Rowley-Conway of Durham University has spent a lifetime piecing together. Peter, tell, tell me about the great mystery of the Mesolithic microliths. This is the Mesolithic Swiss Army knife. I think they're part of relatively lightweight hunting equipment for use on a variety of different species. Big ones like aurochs, small ones like roe deer, things in between like red deer and wild boar. And with those, you can't always be sure what kind of animal you're going to encounter next. You want a tool like a microlith, which you can put into a variety of different arrowheads, so you've got the right kind of thing with you. Also, you've got the potential of wounding an animal and following it up. So the result is, you are then tracking an animal and perhaps hunting it on several different occasions, over perhaps as much as a day, a big animal like an aurochs. Aurochs, of course, are the archetypal wild cattle from whom modern domestic cattle are, de are descended, but aurochs are very, very large indeed. This is a shin bone of a modern domestic cow. If I hold up the shin bone of an aurochs alongside it, you'll get what I'm saying, the impression that an aurochs is a very large animal indeed. So if you can imagine a Spanish fighting bull, but about three times the size and probably three times as evil, then you've got a rough idea of what an aurochs is all about. So even with tiny flint weapons, our ancestors could take on mighty aurochs. In one find, an ancient skeleton was pierced with 16 arrowheads. They also had a weapon of a different kind, dogs. As today, these could have been ancient hunting companions to track wounded prey or flush out game. And their reverence for the many different animals they hunted is stunningly revealed in the cave paintings they left behind. It's absolutely incredible. It's not something I'm used to seeing in Britain. The sight of bison browsing. Of course, I've seen these animals in the wild in other parts of Eastern Europe, over in Belarus. And it's an incredible feeling when you're moving through the woods and you come across a herd of these animals. I remember one frosty morning, first sign of them being the mist coming up from their breath. Incredible sight. And think that our ancestors lived alongside these sites. I'm sure to them, this just looked like a meat fest on the hoof. But it wasn't simply about their prey, nor the weapons they had but about how to get close to them, and they could have learned that from another predator they knew. When I travel in the wilderness areas of the Northern Hemisphere, I see wolf tracks on virtually a daily basis but I can count on one hand the times I've actually seen the animals themselves. They're incredibly elusive. So coming to a park like this is fantastic. It gives the most wonderful opportunities to see them up close. Throughout the Northern Hemisphere though, farming communities have traditionally loathed and hated the wolf for their interference with livestock. 
But what interests me is that hunter-gatherers have a completely different relationship. They revere the animal for its hunting prowess and look to it to teach them how. Wolves are incredibly intelligent creatures. And this was something that wasn't lost on hunter-gatherers. They learned from them. They realised how successful they were as hunters by working together as a pack, as a society. They understood about moving stealthily, being cautious, sniffing the breeze. They became aware of the importance of wind in hunting. Sometimes they even took the wolf's skin and put it on themselves to mimic it, which would enable them to get closer to herds of bison. This is the ancient knowledge I still use when I'm hunting today. Even with a rifle, these are essential skills, and I'm after quarry. <coughs> well, there we are, there's the beast. Beautiful young red deer, lovely animal, cleanly killed and uh, incredibly healthy meat. And a moment like this for our ancestors, just as many of the hunter-gatherers I've worked with, is incredibly important. Although you can gather wild plants, it's very difficult to live just on those. Even in the tropical areas, meat plays a very, very important, if not crucial, part of the wild diet. Successfully hunting an animal meant life was secure for a number of days. Very important, it can't be underestimated. It's something that today we take for granted. Meat comes just much too easily. Polythene trays with cling film over the top in the supermarkets. Actually going out and finding your meat for real and then relying on that is a whole different ball game. And it's one in which the hunter and in many ways the male part of life was tremendously important. Gordon, you could give me a hand here. Sure. If you just hold that back a little bit right for ahead. me. That's good. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break a little bit with kind of the traditions of the deer of today uh -huh. and show you what a lot of the hunter-gatherer groups that I've worked with do at moments like this. Hunters, of course, will have expended a lot of energy to catch their food. food. They'll very often walk long distances and stalking and um, so they're pretty savage. They're very hungry normally at this point. And there are two things that are often done. A lot of the cultures in Northern Europe will, when they've got the animal, will bleed it and drink the blood straight away. Uh -huh. And there's carbohydrates of in there. Of course, the blood sugar. Sort of thing. <clears throat> and it gives them the energy. And then the other thing they do is they take the liver and they cook the liver. That's a very healthy liver there. It is a very good looking liver as the, as the hunters cut. And of course you inspect a liver to make sure that there are no signs of disease. So what would you look for? Look here? for hardening around the edge, white marks, blemishes, anything that looks out of the ordinary. That looks very healthy, this liver. And the way that's cooked is straight on the fire. What we do, I'm just going to flatten the fire down. Got a good ember base here. And believe it or not, it's very straightforward. Straight into the embers. It doesn't take very long. So it makes good sense that they start with the liver as their first, uh, first food, doesn't it? Because the liver's full of glycogen, a uh, huge energy yield. And the B vitamins too, particularly, particularly vitamin B12, yeah. which of course is in uh, uh, short supply in a lot of the other components of diet. And very important, these things, for digestion as well, That's for right. proper digestion of the foods. I mean, it's strange that the bits that today people often are afraid to eat were actually the delicacies of the past. Mm. And at moments like this, I think back to what I've seen elsewhere. In the Kalahari, I've seen young boys come out to join the men at a kill site when they cook the liver, just so that they could taste liver, because it's a, it's a special thing, because they're hunters. And, and for the Bushmen, hunting is everything for the men, everything. And, and amongst the Hadza in Africa, I've seen them cook, kill a small deer with, with bows, make fire, cook everything, cook the liver like this, cook the whole animal, 
and one sits around and they take even the ribs and they cook them and then they crunch them in their teeth to get the marrow out. So it emphasizes the enormous value of marrow and its fat content. Fat is such a, such a premium, isn't it? Especially late, in the, late, late winter and early spring when the, the animals are rather depleted of fat. It's amazing. It is, it's how little they waste. Everything gets eaten mostly. I think that's looking pretty good. Gordon, let's have, uh, let's have a spot of this. I'm going to give you a bit. If I give you that bit there, that looks great. It's lovely. Now, the way these things are normally eaten is to take a knife, hold it in the mouth and cut oh, it off. I see right. Here, here. Make sure you don't cut your nose off. <laughs> yes, it was pretty close. <laughs> That's delicious. What do you think? That is absolutely delicious. Good, isn't it? In Canada, Gordon, even the heads are cooked. You know, they, they, there they take the caribou and they'll suspend them from their antlers and spin them beside a cooking fire to cook the nose, which is, again, is a delicacy. Oh, I never thought of eating a nose. It's amazing, isn't it? Oh, yes. Mm. <laughs> oh, this is good. With the energy from the liver, a hunter had enough strength to take the carcass back to camp. In the heat of summer, it's essential to get the meat in shade and away from flies and other predators. But after that, the challenge becomes how to deal with such a huge glut of meat. I've got several ways in mind, but we can't eat it all fresh, so it's important to preserve some. Preservation would have been essential to our ancestors, stretching this important protein forward into a future when resources were uncertain. And just as I've seen other hunter-gatherers do, I'm going to air dry some. All you need is a wigwam of poles and some thatch. Here I'm using sallow leaves just to hold the warm air around the meat and speed up the drying. Then set under the rack a small smoky fire. All the time there's a breeze coming through, that's good because the breeze helps to dry the meat. When the breeze drops then the smoke will fill up in there and that will help as well. The key to preparing the venison slabs for the smoker is to cut the meat as thinly as possible. We take one of these slabs and we slice into it. and you start to unroll it like a spiral. Today, if we were going to preserve this meat, we would salt it. But of course, our ancestors didn't have that, ad that advantage. See how that small piece is now becoming a very long, thin piece of meat. Bye and rolling it like that. The other thing I'm going to do is any thick areas, I'm just going to slash them a little bit. It just opens the meat up, helps it to dry. And go on there. So, let's have a look. That is working. It's quite a good temperature in here. It's not hot, but it is gently warm, oh, which is ideal. And uh, don't you put your hand in a fill, Gordon. Put your hand in a fill. Yeah, sure. This is, it's all right, isn't it? It's just a nice warmth. So yeah. It was air, air circulating fairly freely. Yeah, that's good. Of course, we could get a lot more in there if we wanted to. There's loads of room. Not too hot. We've got the we've got the meat well high above the heat. The drying will take several days, but that's no problem when you know how to live in the woods rather than simply camp out for a night or two.
After sleeping out under the trees, there's a beauty to the first rays of warming sunlight, which I adore. It's a timeless scene, and I like to think of our ancestors perhaps beginning their day in a similar glade all those years ago. After the hunt, it's time to go gathering. And today we're after berries, which will complement the meat and give us a whole range of essential vitamins, antioxidants and sugars. The ground floor is covered with berries. We have the uh, bilberry, as we know it further south, or the blaeberry here. And the thing about the blaeberry is that it has, although it's sweet, it doesn't give you the sort of lift in blood sugars that you normally expect with the berry. Uh, it has a compound in it which actually reduces blood sugar. It actually makes you feel a bit weak sometimes uh, because of this, this compound in it, but eventually if the sugars come through. Sometimes mixed with the blaeberries or bilberries, we often get uh, lingon berries, as they're known in Scandinavia, or cowberries, as we uh, term them here in, in, in Britain. And uh, I think we'll gather some of these and take them back to camp and process them there. And uh, we're using this uh, gathering iron here, a copy of, of something that's used very widely in amongst indigenous peoples uh, worldwide who have access to these sort of berries. The tradition has continued to make, make these uh, a bilberry or uh, a cowberry comas. Everything's up for grabs in the woods, and like hunter-gatherers I've met, I'm sure our forebears wouldn't have turned away the chance of a nutritious snack. There weren't so many insects in Britain that could be used for food, but one that can, and which we know was used widely across northern Europe, is this, the wood ant. Uh, this is a wood ant's nest, and inside there, at this time of year, will be larvae and pupae, which are edible. And the trick is, to get the ants to do the work for you, to do the collecting for you. And it's going to look pretty destructive, but in fact you can raid a wood ant's nest in this way twice in the year without necessarily destroying it. What I've got to do is I've got to break into this nest without being stung or squirted by the ants here. And I do that by just going straight in. And down in here they're like little bits of rice crispy. Those are the pupae and the larvae. It's very warm in here. As long as I'm quick, I get away with it. You can smell the formic acid. It's like vinegar. That should be enough. No stings. Got away with that. Move that down into the middle. Now, I'm going to throw some sticks around the edge to create shade. And I fold in the edges and the ants will start to move the larvae and the pupae into the shade. We trick them in to do the collecting for us. These ants are squirting all this formic acid. I don't know whether you can see this, but the flower is turning pink where the ants are squirting it with formic acid. To give you some idea how strong a change that was. There's some unaffected flowers for comparison. Isn't that incredible? It's like litmus paper. You can do this with a lot of flowers, bluebells, harebells, wood anemones. Amazing. If you get too close to one of these nests when you disturb it and the formic acid comes up, it's choking. It's a very effective defense mechanism. Let's have some of these adults. You like ants, don't you? No, I like the flavor of these adults. Sharp. Mm. Nice and vinegary. Mm. Best, to, best to kill them before you eat them. Uh, so you're going to get your tongue out of it. This is true. My, my grandsons love them. Um, after you taught me how to, how to get these um, pupae and larvae out, we've been, been visiting a few nests and uh, uh, we generally uh, uh, dry fry them. Yeah, they're very nice. They're and, like uh, shrimp, aren't they? They are. And uh, they've worked very well. And, uh, but they also, they also like the adults. It's a clever method of getting the ants to, to 
to do the collecting. But I guess our ancestors could have got a clue to using these for food by seeing the nests raided by green woodpeckers and ah, by badgers. Yes. And they'd have had a look and in your natural inquisitiveness and it leads the way, doesn't it, really? That's right. Oh, there's some oh, that's nice people here. Let's look at those. Not much of a taste. Very bland. No, they're very bland, aren't they? And they're hardly any being collected. I, I think we're about a week too late, probably. Yes. This nest is shutting down now. Well, I think what we can do is collect this up and put it back in no, the nest and the nest. help them, and then uh, maybe some other hunter-gatherers will come next year and help themselves. We think of summer as bountiful, but even in this season of plenty, slight local variations in climate can massively change not only the quality of what's available, but also when it's in its prime. So the ant harvest was disappointing, but we're on song with the berries. Oh, Gordon, that really is a remarkable harvest. We've done pretty well, haven't we? <laughs> Amazingly well. Good array um, of these, so shall we put on the yeah, put some on there, mate. Yeah, put the space for the ling on us. Massive, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's one really interests me, the ling on. Yeah. And then we've got elderberry. When we were kids, we used to shoot these from catapults in a in an early form of paintball. <laughs> and our mothers didn't like it because of the uh, yes, the stain is really very stains. tenacious, isn't it? Yeah. Bird cherry. There's now there's a lot of uh, cyanide in that. That's right, and uh, of course uh, they use those same chemicals from uh, uh, cherry pips uh, to get rid of lice, head lice. So what an array! Each berry has different qualities. The rose hips are full of vitamin C, with seeds covered in irritating hairs, perfect for use as itching powder. Bird cherries can be made edible by grinding them, stone and all, then heating them, which drives off the cyanide they contain to give a tasty biscuit. It's a recipe I'm glad Gordon tried first. I, I, can, eat, I, can, eat a, I can eat a lot of this. The weather the teeth would survive, it's another matter. Quite crunchy. Native people in Russia have relied on these fruits and also in northern cultures, cowberries are used widely as a preservative both in combination with meat and alone in clear water, they'll last for months. Virtues that would not have been lost on our ancestors. All that venison back at camp is crying out for one more berry that's around here and ripe for the picking. This tree bears another edible berry. This is juniper, of course famous for gin. But one of the other uses of juniper berries is to season wild venison, for which it excels. For that reason, I'm going to collect a whole load. A bit small this year, which is probably a product of the long, hot summer. But despite that, I've got that wonderfully aromatic flavour. Beautiful. One of the great things about juniper berries, of course, is once you've got them dried, they last for ages. They're just the most amazing. Thing to put in a marinade of venison. A bit of red wine, a few juniper berries, and you're laughing. I'm not sure Gordon will approve, it's not very archaeological. However, it's very tasty. I know what he'll say. So now what's the evidence for the use of red wine in the Mesolithic? <laughs> None. Didn't they just wish they had it? Well, they may be small, but they really make up for it in their potency. I'm not going to need many of these. In fact, I think I've got enough now. Brilliant. Probably noticed I brought a few cooking utensils a with few me. Indeed, yes, a rather impressive array. Well, I thought it was time we actually cooked something a little bit more conventional with some of the wild stuff we've got with us. What Fancy. I, what I have in mind is um, not to cook all wild things. I think we're going to mix a little bit of modern and a little bit of old and mm. we'll do it outdoors and ah. see what we come up with. I really enjoy the whole process from hunting, selecting the deer, hunting the deer 
and uh, butchering it to cooking it. The whole process is magic. You're completely in touch with your food. And the venison casserole is just a classic dish of the woods. And to go with it, I have a spectacular and unusual dessert for which I need one key wild ingredient and Gordon's on the case. Now there are three types of sorrel in Britain that are common. We have the wood sorrel, which is, uh, has leaves a bit like a clover, um, and the uh, sheep sorrel, which is quite small, has little arrow-shaped leaves, and then the common sorrel, which is what we have here, which is the one that Ray needs for his cookery. All three sorrels have a, a very distinctive taste, um, and uh, if we try this... Mm. Sour, a, a, a very, very uh, sharp taste. A bit like lemon, so let's go gathering. What I want to do is just brown this meat off. Mm -hmm. Trying to smell good. Now I'm going to add the garlic. I didn't add it earlier because I didn't want to toast it. I just want it to do its thing in a very natural way. So in the marinade, a um, good bottle of red wine, some bay leaves, some thyme, some carrot, celery, um, and juniper berries. Now, to make the stock, what I've got here is the bones that we took the meat from. We may have changed many aspects of how we live since the Mesolithic, but one thing that hasn't changed is our physiology. By eating what was fresh and seasonal, our ancestors had a diet we would recognize as extremely healthy today. Now I'm going to add that to the meat in there. So by using the same wild ingredients, we can still provide our bodies with the diversity of foods we need, even if we've brought the recipes up to date. There we go. Now it's going to sit there and cook for most of the day. Nice and slowly, gently. And for pudding, the sorrel's been roughly shredded to make a treat for Gordon. What has to happen to this now? I'm going to put some hot water in there. I have to boil this down. In fact, I have to boil it until it boils dry. Just on. It's quite tricky. If I overboil it, obviously it'll scorch. I don't want that to happen. Let's get it on there. I'll put the lid on until it comes up to a good boil. And then I will take the lid off and raise it up a little bit so I can watch what's going on. Because what I want to make are some tartlets with the sorrel. It's rather a surprising recipe. So, first job. I've got some little tartlet dishes here, which I've greased. So. I, guess, I guess some people might think that this style of cooking and camping in the woods don't go hand in hand, but of course all of our modern ovens had their origin in the campfire. And um, these cast iron pots are wonderful ovens. They make all sorts of cooking possible. And uh, being able to cook outdoors is incredibly important for morale. It's about being able to live outdoors, not, not just visit it in a temporary fashion. Dinner may be modern fare, but Gordon's not lost touch with the past. As part of our ongoing experiments, he's keen to test out an ancient Maori recipe from New Zealand for eating bracken roots. So 
whether this stand is, uh, it seems pretty good by, by British standards, whether it's up to the, what, what the Maori required of their stands of, 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 of good roots, as they called them, is another matter. They were very fussy indeed, and only a tiny fraction of the stands were suitable for their purposes. This may be more like what we're after. This is not too old, like some of the big, big ones that have been so far. This is white, this white, a gooey layer of starch-rich material, but unfortunately a very thick core of, of fibres too. So whether we'll, uh, whether it'll provide anything like the amount of starch we need to uh, give us a thick uh, sludge of goo, I don't know. Bracken roots are potentially toxic, so we're following the Maori recipe closely, even though it seems counterintuitive. It says to dry them then rehydrate them, and these roots have had three days soaking. But although they've swollen up to their original size, which is good, they're still hard as rock. And uh, this is a bit, of a, a bit of a surprise. So how it's going to be when we beat them, and, uh, which is the next stage indicated by the Maori recipes, if you like, I have no idea. Well, immediately you can see white flesh there, but uh, some of it's a bit brown, which is, means it's a bit old, and they say that you get this uh, mushy stuff coming out, glutinous, it is glutinous, I can, I can, I can feel it's slimy. We haven't got a mass of, of white stuff uh, being liberated. Let's try a little bit more anyhow. Pretty gooey. Right, let's tip this stuff out and see what it's like and see if we can get it free from the fibres. No, no, this, is, this, this isn't getting it free from the, from the fibres at all. The, the fragments of fibres are, are carried over with the, with the goo anyhow. Um, it's not working. Ray, what do you reckon? We've got this problem of not really knowing what made a, a Maori's perfect stand. No, there's no description of what made a good stand, only that they knew good from bad. And that they're prepared to send their good grounds to the, to the death. So, well, it's worth a, worth a go anyhow. Definitely worth a go, and I think the gooiness suggests that there is good starch in there. Yes, it starts there somewhere. Yep. So there's more work to be done before we crack bracken. Gordon's dregs aren't anything like food, but I reckon my sorrel paste has far more potential. All of those sorrel leaves have boiled down and dissolved, actually, into this thick, green, very unattractive looking paste. You can see there, it doesn't look very uh, appealing, does it? But appearances can be deceptive. What I have to do with that now is I'm going to add to that some sour cream. Mix it in steadily, which I'm going to whisk in. And now I'm going to put a drop of sugar in there. quite sour, so it's going to need a little bit of that. Hmm, yeah. good. green concoction in to the tartlets. And there we have it. Well, that's for dessert. And I've got to finish the main course now. I'm going to put those somewhere safe. There we go. Oh, one one yeah. venison oh, casserole. Wow. That is something special. That smells and, um, absolutely delicious. To go with it, roast potatoes. Oh, fantastic. Bon appétit. Oh, thank you. Let's see how the meat is. Mm. Oh, that is just so good. Those flavours. Tender and magical. <laughs> All good stuff in here. <clears throat> so the whole day cooking has paid off, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That was all right, wasn't it? Brilliant, that was delicious. Well, I've got a real delight for you for dessert. 
Well, this looks pretty remarkable. You remember the uh, sorrel that you gathered? Yes, indeed. I'm very fond of sorrel. Well, I've turned it into a sorrel tartlet for dessert. What do you make of that? Well, I, I, I really enjoy sorrel, but I, I've never seen anything quite like this before. <laughs> I wouldn't see what it resembles. It's absolutely delicious. Oh, that's lovely. What does it remind you of? It's got a sharp flavour to it, which I really, really like. A bit rhubarb -y, isn't it? This is very, very reminiscent of rhubarb. It's absolutely delicious. Secret recipe, that. No, no need to me and the viewers. <laughs> this is going to catch on in a big way, I think. <laughs> kind of if a... If I'd known you were going to produce this way, we would have worn black tie. <laughs> Well, we haven't got our head torches on. I think that makes it a formal dinner. Mm. Well, I think I'll have to try some of this too. Mm. Your good health. You too. Mm. Mm. That's lovely. I can see Mr Kipling writing to you shortly too. <laughs> <laughs> Offered by the idea. <laughs> After days in the woods, I am drawn to how darkness transforms this world. The calls of owl or barking fox, night jars and bats filling the night. Yet I like to imagine the noises our ancestors would have known that we can no longer hear wild in Britain. Like a wolf's howl, the footfall of a bear or a bison's guttural rumble. It's a wonderful way to time travel before dawn breaks on our last day in camp. Ooh, chilly this morning. Autumn seems to sneak up on you at the end of summer. The first thing you notice are these heavy mists. That's a sure sign that autumn's on its way. First job in the morning, get the fire on, hot water for a shower. Begin to really appreciate it now. It's staggering that a single kill which has already given us many meals, can still provide for a feast. That's good, Gordon. I'm going to end up here. All right. Yep. So today, I have got some guests in my camp. I have uh, some soldiers coming from the Gurkhas. I keep bumping into Gurkhas when I'm overseas. Whenever I do, they've been kind enough to invite me and my parties for... Uh, dinner so I thought uh, we should do a return match. What I'm going to do is we're going to cook this deer in more of an Aboriginal way we're going to cook it underground. Very basic dismantling job just cut the two haunches and the remaining shoulder off and that's what we're going to cook underground today. It'll be beautiful. Hello. 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 Welcome to camp. Ray. BJ. Hi BJ. Hi. I'm Gordon. Nice to meet you. Hello. 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 But there's no such thing as a free lunch. There's a pit to be dug and a fire to be made to heat some rocks. And my guests set to in impressive style. King Alfred's cake fungus found growing on dead wood can catch a spark and create a tiny ember. The rocks will slowly absorb the heat of the fire until they glow and they'll then release that heat to cook our venison in the pit. 
It takes a while, so we've got time to gather my favourite wild roots to roast alongside the venison. What we're after is burdock. This great herb grows over two years and the big leaves of its first summer signify a tasty tuber underground. So here we have uh, uh, the flesh white, glistening with starch and uh, uh, full of nutrients. Wow, that is fantastic. You look like you need a feed now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm robust enough to dig this sort of hole, no problem. That's a fantastic amount of food there. Well done. Bye. So it's time to get down to the cookery. The burdock roots are cleaned up. Scorching rocks line the pit. The venison and veg go in. Okay, burdock roots. And then the pit is sealed. Pit cooking is typical of feasting I've witnessed. And though it takes a lot of energy to prepare, the calories in the venison will more than replace what's been used and just goes to underline the importance of meat in a hunter-gatherer diet. While it's cooking, we've got time to check on the drying rack. I've never seen this uh, actually done before. It's very interesting. Well, you can see now the meat's stiff. Well, that is the way it's dry. Absolutely, and I'm very surprised to see that. I, I thought with all the crosswinds uh, taking the heat away, we would fail to heat up to the top here. All, all the heat was to do was to create dry air here. Ah, and this right. just holds it. I didn't want to cook it. This hasn't right. been cooked. It's just been dried. And the smoke helps to deter flies. You can try a bit of this, Gordon. That's now ready. That's ready now to, to eat. That's, this, is, that's, this, is, this is jerky. E effectively, it's jerky, yeah. Unseasoned jerky. It's very good. It's nice, isn't it? Mm. And of course, that can be stored indefinitely now, put into a skin bag and carried. So maybe yeah. maybe here, 8,000, 6,000 years ago, who knows? They're doing this, they? There may have been a hunting camp. And they probably would have left these smokers in place and just refreshed them when they next needed to use them. Marvellous. Good stuff. Of course, jerky will keep you going, but for my money, you can't beat pit roast venison. Well, fellas, it's had, um, it's had more than two and a half hours. I reckon it should be done. Only one way to find out, and that's to dig it up. And we've invited Peter back to try it. Smell that burdock roof. I can smell the burdock. Ah, oh, what a goodie smell. I mean, <laughs> Okay, so that could go out onto the leaves we cut a moment ago. Yeah. Oh, that's well done. Oh, that looks so good. Peter, you've got an archaeological guest here. Peter is a, an expert on the hunting techniques from the Stone Age. Mm. Gives a whole new insight. Good isn't it? Mm. Brilliant. Mm. Guys, you've done the work. Enjoy it. You were near, Pascal. Then burdock is. I don't know whether you've had burdock cooked in a ground oven before. Have you done that? Not in a ground oven. Yeah. I've always cooked it. I've always cooked it in the embers before. Yeah. And rather over fast. Which is the quick way. Let's try that and see. So this is the outer cortical layer here. Yeah. Good, isn't it? Better than cooked in the embers. Yeah, definitely. It's like sweet potato. <laughs> we don't know for sure if our ancestors feasted this way, but from our experiments at camp, I'm confident Mesolithic hunters were not simply scraping a living, but were at home in forests full of opportunity and making use of it all. Well, we're coming towards the end of our camping. Yeah, Gordon, and it seems to leave me with more questions than answers. Yes, absolutely. We've got some further work to do before we get a resolution, I think. When I think back over the summers that we've been out working this time of year, and all the small victories that we've had, 
it just shows you how much knowledge has been lost. Absolutely. It's, it's generations of knowledge that's been lost because in our lifetimes there are only so many summers that we can work on these species. That's right. People speak so glibly about this and that being edible. But how is it done? I think the other thing that I find interesting about uh, our ancestors is when we look at the archaeological record, as Peter quite rightly said, you know, there are lots of tools that illustrate that there was a lot of hunting going on, that hunting was tremendously important to our ancestors. And yet as a society today, we barely understand hunting. Yes, it could be a glimpse, a little narrow glimpse of the past uh, and the importance of that sort of resource. But I've really enjoyed being out. I don't know about you, I feel quite oh, yeah. weary now. It's, it's <laughs> the hot weather is very sapping, isn't it? It is. And uh, but it's been a, a real pleasure to be in this lovely part of the world and in this gorgeous woodland here.